All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Age of Information. As always, I'm your host, Adam Patrick. Today, I am joined by the illustrious David Wemhoff. David is the author of John Courtney Murray, Time Life in the American Proposition, How the CIA's Doctrinal Warfare Program Changed the Catholic Church. That is one volume, and that is the other volume. And um, Mr. Wemhoff, I, I will tell you, I have read a lot of books, especially over the last three years, and this is at the top of the list of things that I recommend everybody goes out and picks up. It's an incredible amount of information. It is almost a thousand pages with who knows how many footnotes and references in the back, and I finished the whole thing in three days. I literally could not put the book down. Um, so congratulations on an incredible feat, and uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's a very high honor um, to get that endorsement from you, and I want to thank you uh, for that, and I, have, and I want to thank you for having me on your show. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, let's start a little bit here. Uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, maybe we'll segue into why you felt you were called to write this book. Sure. Um, well, I'm born and uh, raised in Indiana. Uh, I went I'm a Catholic. I, I went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, went to the University of Notre Dame. <clears throat> That's where I lost my faith, uh, of course, at the University of Notre Dame. Came back, uh, went in, uh, in, into the Army for a while. Uh, and then after that, I became a lawyer. And um, I practiced in California. I came back to the Midwest. Uh, to Indiana in particular, uh, and I it was late 90s, I want to say 1998, it was right around Christmas of 1998, somebody left in the pew a little piece of paper about the, the pro-life movement, to put your name in support of the pro-life movement to be published in some ad in the local newspaper, uh, so that's what I did, I filled that out, and then I just started reading and learning more about the pro-life. I started getting closer to the Catholic faith, coming back to the faith. And uh, I started to study uh, some of the language that the pro-lifers were using. Uh, I started to study the Constitution more. I'm a lawyer. Uh, and then also, too, what I did is I studied the Catholic faith. And I started to read papal encyclicals because I wanted to compare uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution with the papal encyclicals. And uh, the encyclicals just sang to me. They just, they just sang to me. The, the, these guys were talking 150, 200 years ago uh, about stuff that made perfect sense to me. I couldn't put them down. I mean, if you read my book in three days, that's that's really a testament. Uh, thank you very much uh, for doing that. And I couldn't put down, I couldn't put down these encyclicals. And then one day I found out, hey, there's a catechism. There's a, there's a what? There's a Catholic catechism? And I ordered that. I got it. And I read it. And as I read it, um, Adam, it was as though someone had taken a sword and ran it through my heart. Uh, it was that powerful of an experience uh, because I knew everything in the catechism was the truth. Everything. Everything was the truth. And I accepted it, didn't understand it, didn't know it all, but I accepted it. And um, that is where I really started to look more into these social legal issues, because I'm a lawyer after all. And so I started reading, I started reading Vatican II documents and Dignitatis Humanae jumped out. I talked to people about that and I started doing my homework. And so then uh, I started on the way to writing this book. Um, and the book, uh, I think I went to 33 different archives. There are about 500 different sources. I did some uh, personal interviews. One of them was uh, Robert Blair Kaiser, who's now passed on. And he was the uh, time correspondent. And uh, he admitted, I've got a quote in there. He admitted that this was a big conspiracy, uh, that Time magazine was in on the conspiracy to shape what happened to Vatican II. Now, now what happened was, was in the minds of people, uh, Vatican II took on a certain meaning. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is if, is if you look at the documents, I've got the, the, um, the, uh, the version right here. If you look at the documents, um, and I'm not an expert in liturgy. I don't know anything about ecclesiology, so I can't talk to those. But if you look at the documents, like Dignitas Humanae, you look at Gaudium et Space, you look at Inter Marifica, these were really, really strong statements uh, about how societies, about how the world should be ordered. So that's how I got into it. And that's, uh, that's, that's why I wrote the book, to get that out and to show the Catholic doctrine on the proper order of states, which I showed. Uh, and also to show just, you know, how and what 
America, how it's organized, how it works. And, you know, the First Amendment is really the heart of the American ideology. It's the heart of liberalism. Um, that is where you have the emphasis on the individual, you know, with free speech, free press, uh, religious liberty, uh, freedom to demonstrate, uh, to petition the government. That's really the heart of the American experiment. That's the heart of liberalism, capital L. And uh, that does a lot of things. It does a lot of things. The First Amendment does a lot of things. What it does, among other things, is it, is it, is it puts the power in the culture in the hands of the private interests or the deep state, as we might call it. It gives them the real power. At the same time, it weakens any church because there's no established church. Um, and at the same time, too, then it's a check on government. And the big things that uh, the, the powerful private interests always were concerned about were the three big things were powerful independent government, a powerful independent church, and a mob of people who figured out they just got screwed. So that's what they got to control. And it's working pretty good up until really kind of the last few years. But anyway, that's that's probably a longer answer than you wanted to hear. But that's that gives you a, the, uh, an insight here. No, we uh, we love long answers here. So don't don't shy away from those. Okay. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting uh, it's interesting to come up with a kind of a starting point for this because we've been on this show and within my circles very critical of, of enlightenment thinking. Uh, but yet here we are in the midst of it, and it's something that doesn't seem like it's going away exactly, even though there is a push towards trying to figure out maybe how to how to utilize it for a more spiritual purpose, let's say, since I don't think that the collapse of Americanism is happening tomorrow. We still have to operate in this system. So <clears throat> it might be um, helpful for folks if we start maybe not necessarily with the Enlightenment itself, but the ideas of, let's say, Locke, Barclay, Hume that come out of the Enlightenment and form the basis for what eventually ends up being the American experiment with um, the Puritans coming uh, over to the colonies and various groups to um, escape what they would see as uh, intolerance of their belief system. Um, of course, these are the same people who, you know, beheaded, a, took, 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 took the head off a king, right? So right, that's um, right. freedom is in the eyes of the beholder, but... Um, maybe the the idea of what the United States of America was meant to be from its founding, because it, it was a very unique uh, style that they were setting up, and how that comes to influence, you know, the Milner Fabian type groups, uh, you know, folks like uh, Cecil Rhodes in sort of taking this capitalistic experiment and going full steam into essentially what you start talking about in the book. Well, uh, that's always a very good question. And so um, you have to go back in time. We get in our time machine and we go back, um, you know, to the 1500s and the 1600s. And of course, what you had in the 1500s, you had the Protestant uh, Reformation. Uh, some people call it a revolution, I think, what it was. It, it, it was very nefarious in many ways, quite frankly. Uh, not only did it uh, serve to uh, take away the Catholic faith, the Catholic religion from a lot of societies, but it also broke up international unity. It broke up Christendom, and that was finalized in the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, where you have the individual states uh, basically enter into different agreements with each other because it's either custom or it's in their benefit. Um, as Patrick Deneen says, and as other commentators have mentioned, to include uh, Emer de Vatel, uh, who lived in the, eight, in, the 17th, in the 18th century, 1700s, um, and also uh, John Epstein, a very great Catholic thinker uh, of the last century, of the 20th century. Uh, what you had is the, the, the countries were coming to the point where they viewed themselves as perfect societies. So the ability to cooperate between the countries was really shattered. Yet Christendom was broken apart. You couldn't rely on the authority of the Pope. Okay. So, uh, and a common religion. Um, so what you go to then is toward the end of the 1500s, you got the English saying, geez, look how the Portuguese and the Spanish are making a lot of money. we got to figure out a way to make money, too. Hmm. So that's what they did. The nobles sat down um, and they said to the king, let's figure out a way to make money because there's Cathay is over there somewhere. Uh, and, um, you know, we're going to find out a shortcut to get there. Well, they ran into North America, but they devised things like stock companies. Uh, they did plans. 
uh, to figure out how to develop this country because they knew that they didn't have all the riches of the Orient here. They had a lot of forests and trees and furs and raw materials, and they had to figure out how to use this. So they came up with different plans in the late 1500s, early 1600s. And they realized we need people to go over there and work it. And so then that's when they started to send the dissidents over, the Puritans. And the Puritans came over uh, you know, and did their work to try to set it up with their ideology and their way of thinking. So from the very beginning, you, you have to understand that, that America from the very beginning was a money-making proposition. Now, um, it was meant for the crown. And what the crown did uh, was uh, called the mercantilist system, where they basically controlled everything. They had different companies that ran what are what became crown colonies, what we now know as states. Different mm -hmm. companies ran those, and they had to attract different people to do it. Now, during the and so you had to get people, you know, from all walks of life, all ethnicities, to come settle this thing to do the work. Okay, so one of the guys who was really um, involved, invested in the colonies and in making money and in trade was a guy who became known as the Earl of Shaftesbury or Lord Ashley. And he was a very wealthy, very powerful Englishman. He basically became the most knowledgeable individual of trade in the 1600s in England. And he met a young guy called John Locke who was studying at Oxford. And what happened was there was right away a meeting of the minds these guys came together and John Locke went to work for Ashley, basically as his secretary of his company to develop North Carolina. And so what happened is Locke wrote a number of propaganda pieces to get people to come to North Carolina. Part of that propaganda piece was you get religious liberty, uh, you get so many acres, stuff like that. So what you have is you have Locke writing his philosophy based on the practical experience Lord um, Lord Ashley or the Earl of Shaftesbury. Uh, I think it was Ashley Cooper, Lord Ashley Cooper, or the Earl of Shaftesbury. Now, he was not alone with his ideas. This was all practical knowledge, how to make a lot of money and have a wealthy society. Okay. Mm. So this was all practical knowledge. He was not the only one. There was another one, another guy called Josiah Childs. Josiah, this is in the 1600s. Josiah Childs was a governor ultimately of the East India Company. And he wrote a number of papers about how to make a lot of money in trade and in developing the resources of an area. And so in order to do that, they studied, uh, and to, in order to do that and in order to do it even better, they studied the Dutch. And the Dutch had certain systems of, of, of freedom and uh, religious freedom, and they had uh, different uh, economic policies with low rents, and they, they filed uh, documents as to the ownership of land. A lot of different really practical commercial uh, business ideas. And so these ideas were taken, and these ideas were looked at by John Locke. And so he came up with his various treatises and his various ideas. They were practical applications. He, he created um, a philosophy, if you will, based on making money and how to do it. And so it was based on uh, basically a pushback um, to a large degree on the mercantile system. And of course, you know, uh, on the Catholic system and England was already, you know, a couple of generations removed from that. And so uh, he wrote this and this, these ideas then came over to the colonies, especially through something called Cato's Letters. Cato's Letters were some of the most influential documents that ever affected American thinking. And they talked about basically the liberal ideal. Uh, this was in the 1720s, early 1720s. These ideas came over and all the American founders, they all read Cato's Letters. They all knew Cato's Letters. They followed it and they understood that you have to build a society where there's a lot of freedoms, there's no, there's religious tolerance, there's freedom of the press, there's all of this stuff, um, what we would call the liberal society, because that helps to make the society wealthy, and it also helps to concentrate wealth. And that is something that Notre Dame professor Patrick Deneen uh, makes very clear in his latest book, just came out, I just finished reading it, Regime Change, is that the liberal order was established to help make some people rich, and control the rest. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, it floats most everybody's boat. And the best way to control people is to float their boats. And the best way to do that is to break up all the old traditional uh, or barriers 
you know, to, to, to make money. So in other words, everything gets monetized, everything gets commodified. And so that is how you are able, you know, to keep everybody kind of busy and doing their own thing and making money and happy. And that is, that is a large, that is really the beginning of the philosophy that came in to form um, uh, America and liberalism. Now, that having been said, you know, um, there was the American Revolution. So, uh, you know, I have a different view on the revolution from a lot of people. My, my view is I think it was largely an economic event. Um, I believe that the founders understood, you know, by 1776, um, you had a separate people in the United States or what is now the United States. The American people, I mean, if you're born on soil and you grow up there and you have the customs and whatever else, the ideas and the traditions and the culture, that's that's kind of your identity. I mean, you know, we're born here in the United States um, and we're different from the English. Um, and so the founders knew that. And so um, when you had the revolution, you had a very uh, strong, almost oppressive English government. Uh, which controlled a lot of the economy here because it was a mercantilist system. Uh, manufacturing was limited, trade was limited, um, and the colonies couldn't make their own currency. They could make paper currency, uh, but that caused a lot of problem with the uh, English. Uh, they didn't like that, uh, and so they tried to restrict that. It caused some problems in the colonies too. So you had an economic pressure there. Um, the American leadership was smart enough to recognize, hey, we're a separate people. Uh, we're getting uh, hurt in some areas economically. And, you know, we have this ideology, which if we can implement it, you know, we can make everything work better. Uh, and so that's they kind of went forward with, as I see it. And, you know, the Constitution was part of that process. It was basically um, protecting those ideas with the Bill of Rights especially the First Amendment, and it was establishing the political structure that allows this set of ideas, this political entity, to keep these ideas alive and to expand, because you had the whole whole Western expansion ahead of you. And I think these guys were looking into the, into the future, going even further. Even, even Washington was talking about uh, an empire. Now, all that having been said, there's still an American people, okay? There's mm -hmm. still an American people. And the natural law still applies to us, you know, whether whether the American government, the U.S. government and the elites want to recognize it or not. And uh, so a, a very big part um, of the American identity is tied up, you know, with liberalism. Um, but it's tied up with other things, too. It's tied up with Christianity. It's tied up with the European descent. It's tied up with certain cultures, certain values. And so that's that's part of who we are as a people. One very important thing that the founders dealt with um, at, in, at the Constitution was the law of nations. Now, if you take a look at Article 1, Section 8 uh, of the Constitution that talks about the Congress, you know, shall make laws compliant with the law of nations. Well, they went back and forth to the Constitutional Convention about that because there was a very well understood body of law of nations at that time. Now, eh, there were some differences. You know, M.R. De Vittel, uh, his thinking had greatly affected the American founders uh, reasons. Um, but he had set forth a lot of rules, which a lot of countries were following. Uh, and the American founders on the Friday uh, in September, September 14, 1787, the Friday before the Monday when they adjourned, they said, OK, we got to list the, the law of nations. The one fellow said, we got to list the law of nations. And I think it was Madison who stood up and said, nah. We'll leave it up to the Congress to determine when they want to and how they want to. Mm. And so that that's how that thing got settled. And that's what the Congress has done ever since then. So America, the United States has seen itself separate. Uh, and it has, you know, it was a successful effort of a people to, to gain its independence. It was a successful implementation of this liberal or American ideology that I refer to in my book. I want to make sure we okay. I want to make sure we didn't lose you there because you paused right at the end of the perfect. Um, so this basically leads us to I, if I had to pick a person to kind of start the narrative, I would pick Cecil Rhodes. Do you think that's a good maybe starting point of his whole idea of the roundtables and this now branching out into RIA uh, and Chatham House and eventually 
We see the Council on Foreign Relations, things like this. These kind of wealthy, nerdy bankers who really are the ones kind of behind the scenes controlling everything. I think it really germinates with him. Would you agree? Yeah, I think Cecil Rhodes had a lot to do with the Anglo-American alliance. By the end of the 1800s, American elites were getting closer and closer together. They had, they had some problems during the Civil War uh, <clears throat> with the Alabama and the Cursarge. Um, uh, and so uh, two ships that got into a fight and that the English actually helped the Confederates to some degree. Um, so th there was a there was a problem there that got resolved in the 1870s and they started to come together uh, and they started to work together and they started to say, we can we can collaborate, we can cooperate uh, in expanding you know, influence around the globe. Now, um, I think the reality is, is that uh, uh, the American leadership uh, wanted to run the show. I mean, there may have been a collaboration with Cecil Rhodes, uh, but there was still a desire by the American leadership uh, to definitely take charge and run the show. And I think that what you had is, yes, you had a very, very strong banker or financial set uh, of people there. And banking and money is always tied to commerce. So, of course, with commerce, you also tie in manufacturing, right? So you can get everybody tied together here if you can expand and open markets around the world and keep control of the money. So, yeah, I think it was a very important uh, uh, catalyst of this. And in time, the Americans themselves you know, wanted to take the ball and run with it. Uh, and that's kind of where my book, you know, comes in on that. Exactly. And we've talked a lot on this show, just reminding the audience about uh, Quigley, Sutton, uh, Riatsu's new book, The Milner Fabian Conspiracy, and how I've said uh, Tragedy and Hope really is, if there's one kind of must-read starting point that helps put things like your book into context, um, that's a really good read for people. Yeah. They really check that out. Um, so what ends up happening really is with the start, I believe with the start of World War One, America really starts to kind of define itself as a potential global leader. And and you can correct me where I'm wrong here. Uh, when World War, when they get sort of a uh, quote unquote sucked into World War Two, which of course is what everybody wanted, the elites wanted, um, there's a clear defined enemy. And then as that war comes to a close, there needs to be another well defined enemy so that the elites can essentially expand banking power, uh, make other countries indebted to, you know, global banking, essentially, and everything is sort of orchestrated around that. Now, there's different players, you know, the CIA, but on, on the ground, CIA operatives probably don't know they're working for bankers, but really, ultimately, <laughs> it's about controlling everything everywhere, making every other country into uh, basically the Americanist style and the Soviet Union is the obvious example here. So we could talk maybe a little bit about how, um, you know, the Dulles brothers, how, how these these characters kind of engineer. Uh, and you, you mentioned C.D. Uh, C.D. Douglas. Uh, I'm sorry, C.D. Jackson in this, too, and Henry Luce, which is Henry Luce really is kind of the central um, kind of operative outside of the clergy. So maybe uh, correct me or expand on how the Americanist agenda sort of coagulates and condenses into this dominate the planet globalism. Well, I think I think I think you're right. I, I think America has been on the march since 1776. I really do. And and I think, you know, um, we've seen one world war after another. A lot of people disagree with me on the numbering, but we've, we know World War One, World War Two, the Cold War was World War Three. It was fought on every continent uh, in almost every country, one form or another of the globe. Uh, world War Four was, I call it the global war on terror. Well, it's called the global war on terror. I think it's World War Four. It's mm -hmm. against international terrorism. Well, okay, it, it tended to target more of the Islamic states than anyone else, but it also expanded into other countries. Um, then now you've got uh, another struggle between what it looks like Russia and China and, and some people that are tagging along with them. And so you've got this thing that keeps growing and growing. I think you're absolutely right. What they were doing is they were trying to expand this idea of the organization of society along the lines of the liberal order, okay? We see this very clearly with Woodrow Wilson when mm. World War I started. He's talking about, you know, overthrowing uh, the Kaiser. We're going to get rid of the Kaiser, and we're going to it's authoritarian, totalitarian government, and we're going to put in democracy. I mean, that was, wow, that was kind of shocking after uh, after hundreds of years of wars, uh, and after, you know, 100 years of relative peace in Europe, 
we're fighting this war to get rid of the Kaiser. We're not going to stop till we're in Berlin. And so we're going to redo that society. And then once you redo those societies, then all the traditional checks and balances on, you know, making money uh, are gone. Uh, a guy by the name of Amatori Fanfani is referenced in my book, The Little Professor, an Italian. Uh, he was a guy who, uh, who taught uh, in the 1930s, 1940s. His doctoral thesis was Catholicism, Protestantism. Uh, and capitalism, he basically explains that that the capitalist spirit has got to knock down these barriers, the barriers to enjoyment of wealth and accumulation and making of wealth. And so that's where you have to re-engineer these societies. And one thing that the, the um, you know, one thing that, that we'll call the deep state, the bankers, you know, the financial elites, one thing they have to do is they have to uh, basically play people against each other. And that's what they're very adept at doing. And they can use anything and everything. And we see that they can use religions against each other. They mm -hmm. can they can build up nations and throw them against each other. They can uh, build up LGBTQ and throw it at us. You know, they can do all of this stuff. And so that's what they're always doing because they really don't like ethnicities, which is something George Soros said. So you're absolutely right. So so what happened is you had beginning with World War One in particular, you had this idea, you had the Federal Reserve at that time came into being, which was a, a way to basically finance these huge wars. I mean, these are big endeavors and you need to have a lot of money to do this stuff. So the Fed came into existence. At the same time, you did away with uh, a Senate chosen by the state legislatures. And at the same time, you did away with, um, you, know, well, you gave the women the right to vote. So, so you're just further expanding democracy in the United States, you're further fractionalizing society and breaking it apart. So now the man and the woman are, are at odds with each other. They can vote against each other, you know? And mm. so what you had is you have this issue going forward into the 20s and 30s. Uh, and of course, the United States is a detail uh, in my book with the Four Freedom speech of FDR in January 1941 was saying, look, we're fighting, you know, we got four freedoms. We're going to spread around the world. I mean, the U.S. wasn't even in the war at that time. You know, four freedoms were spread around the world. Basically, you know, freedom from fear, freedom to speak, freedom of religion, freedom from want. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> These are the euphemisms that we're going to use. Henry Luce came up a month later and said, you know, we're fighting for commerce. We want our commerce to run the world. It was very plain what was going on. And, and they were actually, you know, pretty honest about it in a lot of ways, that this is what's coming. And so that is what ultimately arrived at our doorstep. And so and so the, the boundaries in Europe were broken down uh, and those societies, you know, are being uh, remade. That's what we've seen for the last, what, 80 years now. Mm -hmm. And really the whole idea of this, this whole push is to destroy church and crown, right? Because it puts, it takes the power out of the individual nation state uh, and puts it in the hands of obviously folks who are trying to get those nation states into debt. <laughs> so uh, in, it's very interesting to see how uh, a system that is designed to break down differences uses false dialectical differences to smash them together in order to kind of meld society into a homogenous blob that has no distinctions. And that's when, you know, th there still is uh, maybe more propaganda going on today in different ways than there was when time life was, you know, a huge entity. But we still have the same people choosing between the false dialectics. So even the the libertarian or you know the the, the QAnon or or whomever thinks that they're kind of tuned into the system, they're actually still being played because there is no ultimate truth that's guiding them and and showing them um, how to get out of this mess. And it's actually it's really easy. It's just nerdy bankers and the American <laughs> established elite pushing an idea. It's really a very simple concept to understand, but you still have. You know, the, the folks who are, let's say, anti-woke are still missing a huge part of the problem, right? That running to just this is just my opinion, running to folks like Ben Shapiro, who are really just there to provide the other side of the dialectic. They're not the ones who are really going to help you. <laughs> right. Anything, right? I, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's a great. That's a great. Yeah. You know what's going on. Yeah, you get it. I mean, I mean, what, what the liberal order does, it puts power in the hands of the powerful private interest people you don't even know. It, put, it puts it in their hands, okay? And these people have no solidarity. They have no sense of solidarity with any of us. I call them the plutocrats. Some people call them oligarchs. I call them plutocrats because they basically utilize the systems uh, for their own benefit uh, to make money and to control people. 
And like I said, they have no solidarity with us. They don't want to develop anything. They want to control everything. And they can control it through the First Amendment. So you bring up a very good point, Ben Shapiro. Right. So what he does is he presents the false side of the dialectic. Well, we want free speech, and they're curtailing our free speech. So what's he doing? Well, he's keeping people in bondage, right? Mm. But what he's also doing is he's he's playing to an American, an aspect of American identity. OK, an aspect of our identity is, well, you know, we're, we, we want to be able to talk about things and work it out. And we're being crushed, you know, by this these people. So but, you know, part of our identity is free speech and all of that. Um, and by going with that identity, you don't get out of the woods. You 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 are just running around in circles. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Instead. And, and part of what the First Amendment does, with all these voices out there, it further fractionalizes people. Everybody, <clears throat> even the Catholics, are very fractured, okay, because they can't seem to work together. The First Amendment and the conservatives are all given the alternate, you know, viewpoint of liberty or of the liberal state. What the in the hands of the right people who really know what they're doing with free speech and free press they can weld people together to create an effective movement. It requires unity. It requires unity. And the American founders were actually very adept at using the First Amendment um, or free speech and free press. And that's why guys like Elbridge Jerry were so insistent at the con at the Constitutional mm -hmm. Convention. You got to guarantee the right of the press and speech because that's how we got everybody on board from what, what is now Maine to Georgia. To fight the British. But they had the same message. The same message was, we're American. This is our country. Well, there's no such message now. You're not allowed to have an American identity. Okay. And there is an American identity. If you're allowed to talk about, you know, free speech or something else, but it's not going to bring people together. You can't say there's an American people. If you say that, you're a nationalist pig. Okay. You're in trouble. You might get an indictment against you. You know, there's an American people. You can't do that. But there is an American people. And that's an inconvenient truth to a lot of people. Yeah, I, I, I find it really interesting that the, uh, you know, mainstream Republican style conservatives and specifically the libertarians are, you know, so against the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab, yet they're operating in exactly the same system that allows something like that just 100 years mentally before right it's it's frustrating to see that and i, I know that many people are well-intentioned uh, but trying to break folks out of that you know you're in the you're promoting a 100 years ago version of the very thing you're against today right you're just putting it off another 100 years which to me just seems tactically dumb i mean <laughs> i don't really know how else to put it you know no i think that's right but you got to know who you are you got to have a vision you got to have an identity. And uh, a lot of people are not allowed to have their identity. I mean, I, I've said a lot of controversial things. Uh, and I think that, you know, with COVID-19, when that came out, uh, you, you have the guys with the camouflage hats sitting there saying this isn't right. I mean, right at the very beginning. You know, they were saying this right at the very beginning. And it, and it was like, well, how do you know? And it's like, I, they, I think that they just kind of knew. Um, and I think that there is this wisdom that comes up from the bottom. Of they know when they're in trouble. People know when they're in trouble, but they're not allowed to say who they are. And and we are an American people. Uh, we are an American nation. OK, um, there is a, a body of law called the law of nations. It's a Catholic idea. Uh, this guy, John Epstein, wrote extensively about it. I, I talk about it somewhat on my website. It's a powerful, important idea. The Catholic Church started to develop this with the School of Salamanca back in the 1500s. OK, that that went up, um, you know, up until the present day. But what happened is when the Protestant Revolution came, the Protestants said, we need an alternative to this. And that's Hugo Grotius. He came up with international law. OK, and it basically a set of rules and customs. That's all it was. But the law of nations was a lot more than that. OK, so the Catholic understanding of all of that came back into a resurgence in the 1800s. And it talks about nations, okay? Nations are groups of people tied together by culture, descent. Um, they live on a piece of ground. They have the same language. They have the same history, 
Okay. All that is tied together. Okay. And that idea came out in the church in the 1800s and with some degree of strength in the 1900s because of World War I, World War II, the rise of the Nazis and the communists. And so what you had is you had in Vatican II, you had the expression in Gaudium et Space of some of this. And when you're starting to talk about nations, you're talking about people who are definable. Okay. Mm. Now, there could be a lot of different subgroups in the nations, but you're talking about people who are definable. I mean, in the United States, there are many nations. You know, you can, there's the black nation. You can say that there's the white nation or the American nation. There are a lot of subgroups of that. You know, there's like the Latin nation, but these are different people with different histories. Now, there's assimilation that goes on, and the church recognized that. But these were still separate nations. And that's the idea of the law of nations, groups of people, because culture and the circumstances of your birth are very important to the proper development of the person. That is how you learn how to deal with society, especially in the family. In the family, you grow up in a certain tradition, a certain place. You learn that tradition, you learn that culture, you learn the right ordering of things in the nuclear family. And so at that point, you move out into society and society has got to strengthen and protect the family. And the international society has got to protect those domestic societies to protect the family. That's why war and that stuff is bad. Okay. That's why the church has always spoken against war. So you have to realize who you are. Okay. And in America, we know from George Soros and we know from the history of, of, you know, just the liberal experiment that they're always trying to break down peoples. They're always trying to destroy peoples. You know, a lot of people say, and I, I think in some degree it's right. They're trying to create a European identity, which does away with the German and the Italian and all of that. They destroy the ethnicities. They're destroying the nations. And so you go back to the Tower of Babel, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, you had Tower of Babel, the, the, the construction, destruction of the Tower of Babel. You had one, one group of people got broken apart. Now they're going to try and rebuild it again. A cultural rebuilding, which is which operates at the behest of the powerful. Now, or the guys behind the scenes. Now, the guys behind the scenes will create their different identity groups, the LGBTQ, whatever they want, you know, from week to week, because they got the means, they control the resources, they have no sense of solidarity, and nobody seems to have any opposite idea. So if you're going to 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 struggle against this plutocratic elite. We're going to struggle against this tyranny because it is a tyranny. It's a very soft tyranny. It's a very clever tyranny. And, and again, Professor Deneen, his latest book, Regime Change, speaks very eloquently about it. I just finished reading it. It's a good book. It's very eloquently of how they control. And, and um, if you're going to fight this, you got to know who you are. And you got to see yourself in the context of a people. And, and you have to understand that nations have a right to live and exist and prosper. Now, they may change over time. Nobody's what's wrong with that. But, but they have to do, be allowed to exist and survive. And right now, the American people are under attack. Blacks are under attack. They don't understand that. The Latins are under attack. They may not understand that. But all the peoples are being worn down to be reshaped in accordance with what George Soros and other people want it to be. So you have to have a vision of where you end up and you got to have a society where you care for the family, you, you care for the nation, you follow what, you know, is in the catechism, what Professor Deneen talks about. You follow something called the common good and it's important to follow in the common good. It's in the catechism. Um, I have a, a little YouTube channel people can watch. I talk about the different aspects of the catechism that talk about it and they're very specific. It is also, too, in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments used to be a big part of American life. They cut that out in 1947 with Everson. And ever since then, they've stripped God away from the local communities. Ever since then, the American people have been under attack. And, and you know, it was one thing after another. And, and now, you know, we're, we're, I mean, we're facing, you know, <clears throat> CRT. I mean, this is, this is, I think, is the mop-up operation. It's um it's probably important to point out too because I know we do have a uh, varied uh, listenership that historically Christianity and even post schism east and west was never uh, concerned with destroying uh, local cultures. That's it right. was 
very much concerned with baptizing local cultures and sort of correcting some of the pagan errors or Gnostic errors. Um, but we see this very clearly, especially in the East with uh, kind of the, the conversion of uh, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine um, in maintaining that very specific culture and, and not diluting, diluting it, not changing it. Um, the Greek culture, the Slavic cultures uh, in the West, Spain, Italy, to retain that sense of identity, um, ju but just make it Christian. Um, and that's lost in what I would say is the Protestant world where it's not Christianity. Christianity doesn't come first, right? It's almost like Christianity has to mold itself to the state's idea of the day. So it's the inversion of the classical uh, Christian way of, of doing this. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. You know, the Monaghan Report, um, uh, I'm studying that right now. The Monaghan Report came out in 65. <clears throat> and it dealt with what was what was going on in the black black community. Why why is you know is there a problem here? What, what's the problem? And they said that <clears throat> that the family for large portions of the blacks were, had been had been had been destroyed in this country um, because of the Protestant culture that which did not adequately treat you know the black slaves as human beings. Moynihan contrasted that with. Um, slavery in, Port in the Portuguese possessions, Brazil. He said the slaves were treated as human beings and they were actually Christianized. So I think this brings the, to the fore your point that Christianity is interested in building these ethnicities, uh, these, these groups of people organically and to make them strong so the family is strong so they can learn how to deal with the world and that is what culture and nationalism is all about. Now, that can get on steroids and get out of control. And we have seen that in the past. You know, we've seen that with Nazism. We've seen that in other areas where it just goes out of control. And, and the church condemns that, too. It condemned that um, with Pius XI and uh, with his encyclicals. So I'll just apologize real quick to the audience and to you. There's um, Canadian doobie smoke that's been... <laughs> infiltrating southern New England over the last few days to the point where it looks like the surface of Mars. Uh, so the constant blinking and coughing and drinking of water is uh, me trying to <laughs> fight off the lingering effects of that. Um, and I also take copious notes. So if it looks like I'm falling asleep, it's because I'm jotting down a bunch of stuff as uh, Mr. Wemhoff is talking. Um, so another book we've been promoting on the show is um, in kind of in tandem with yours is Operation Gladio by Paul Williams, which talks a lot about just to your point on the afflictions in the black community and creating, um, you know, opiate addicts. And of course, we all know about Gary Webb and where that goes, you know, 20, 30 years later um, that, yes, 100 percent there. Different communities are controlled differently, but they're all manipulated or controlled in some way, which that long introduction brings us really to the heart of the book. And there's some big players here that I, I kind of want you to touch on for the audience. Um, obviously, Henry Luce and John Courtney Murray are right in the title of the book, so they're going to be important. But it might, because we've talked a lot about politics, geopolitics to start, it might be interesting to kind of let the audience know exactly what is going on in, in the Roman Catholic Church at this time. I know Pius XII would be Pope, uh, what, 1939, I believe. So during World War II and into the start of the story, um, what is happening in the Roman Catholic Church prior to Henry Luce and Time Life magazine deciding that with the CIA's help, they're going to now try to infiltrate and manipulate the church decisions? Is there... Wait, I'll, I'll let you just go into it. No, those are great questions, uh, Adam. Thank you. Uh, the church was fighting internally something called modernism, and my book talks about Americanism. Um, and uh, Pius X in, uh, what was it, 1910, I believe it was, he issued his encyclical about the modernist oath. He said, you got to take the modernist oath, you got to reject modernism, because it was creeping in. The basis of it was vital eminence, where basically everything you look in on yourself, you look at your navel, you know, whatever this sense of religion is, that's legitimate, individualizes everything. Okay. Now, before that, Leo the 13th in 1899, January 22nd, issued an encyclical by the name of uh, Tessin Benevolentiae Nostrae. Nostre. And he said, hey, this thing, Americanism is a bad thing. And so he uh, explained what Americanism was. He says it's a lot of things, but um, he says it's it's downplaying parts 
of the faith in order to bring people into the faith. Um, it is uh, basically saying that the liberties that are in civil society, American society, should apply in the church. And so what he's saying there, he's saying, you know, if you think America teaches the church and not the other way around, you're wrong. OK, the church teaches America. He noticed in Longinquo Oceani that came out four years earlier, he said, there's an American people. He said that there's an American people and there's a Negro people and there's an Indian people. And we need to, to send the missionaries out to the Negroes and to the Indians. And that's what he said. And but he said in 1899, going back to 1899, is we've got um, an issue with people think that America is the ideal. And what you had is you had a lot of American prelates, not all of them, not all of them, but one of the biggest ones I found was Cardinal Gibbons, very famous. He started Catholic University of America, uh, but he was an Americanist. He believed America got it right. We got to listen to what America says. We got to we got to organize ourselves the way America does. Um, he had friends over in Italy, and I document some of that friendship in the earlier parts of the book in volume one. And these people, and this is at the Notre Dame Library, I found this. And so these people had friends over at Notre, over in, in Northern Italy who were trying to get the American idea, uh, the Americanist way of thinking about liberalism in the church to, to, to get more popular. So <clears throat> you had a real division in the Catholic Church in America. And Henry Luce knew it. And so did the American elites. Because Henry Luce really carried water for the elites, for the financial and the business class. They didn't really consider him to be one of them, and he didn't like that, but he carried water for him. He was an engineer. He could figure out how to get people on their side or at least break society up better so they could be better controlled. Okay, so <clears throat> he knew that, and he was going to play to that break in the Catholic Church. He was going to exploit that break in the Catholic Church. And the flashpoint was how to organize basically society, which was Leo XIII and his teaching on the proper order of society. Um, Henry Luce was writing about this in Time Magazine in 1927. So they were looking at this long in advance. And, and you know, let, let me tell you something. Um, the U.S. government and the American elites, these guys think long term. I mean, long term. I mean, they think 30, 50, 100 years ahead. They're, they're not flash in the pan guys. They think long terms. And now they're probably even thinking longer term. But um, he, they knew this was the issue and he needed a theologian to sell everybody on the system of organization of America as contained in the First Amendment, because that system of organization went against what Leo XIII said about how societies should be organized. And so that's where he went looking around and he found John Courtney Murray. Now, um, the Jesuits had long been uh, very much sympathetic to the American system of social organization. And so the Jesuits kind of led that charge with America Magazine uh, and others. Uh, what happened is in April of 1948, April 26th at the Biltmore, there was a secret meeting. I was able to get those minutes uh, from the archives of Father Connell, who was a, a Catholic priest who fought against Americanism. It was a secret meeting that basically was sponsored by the National Conference of Catholics and Jews, a National Conference of Christians and Jews, I'm sorry, NCCJ. And uh, this conference basically dealt with, what are we going to do with this Catholic doctrine on church and state? Okay. I mean, come on, this is a problem. Uh, John Courtney Murray was at that meeting. He said, I can handle it. I can change it. He said, it's not that well defined. Eh, it really is. So then he started, he started writing his stuff. But, but he depicted, he picked the field of battle. And the field battle was, um, can a government suppress heresy? Oh, my God, in America, you don't, you don't want the government coming into your house and making you confess a religion. No, nobody wants. So nobody wants that. So right away, the question was laid out there in a sympathetic way, all right, uh, to the audience. Uh, and the base of his argument was all you need is the natural law. And America complies with the natural law. Well, Connell and others said, no, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong, okay? Um, they said the ideal is not America. Um, it is the divine positive law as a Catholic confessional state. You can follow the natural law, but you have to protect it. And um, 
Murray said in his writings and at the Rockefeller Commission, Murray said, America is perfectly in accordance with the natural law. Well, Monsignor Shea, who I talk about, said that's balderdash. History doesn't bear this guy out. We've, we've never had a society where you didn't have an established church to try to recognize the Decalogue, some form of, of, of deity with his rules. And so this was totally alien. Um, but Luce had, you know, the media and the American media followed Luce and his people. And the mainstream media, like then, is very powerful like it is today. And so what happened is Murray got promoted. You know, the fights were staged with some Protestants who didn't like the Catholics. And so these fights are staged. And Murray made a, a national name for himself. And he became a friend of Luce and Claire Booth Luce. They're all in New York. And uh, I call them the Trinity. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> the, the one... The one character in the book, John Courtney Murray, that's for me, it was it's tough to know if he was a quote unquote true believer. And I don't mean in Christianity. It's pretty clear that's not true. But was he a true believer in the Americanist vision or was he just an opportunist who saw a way to make a name for himself and a bunch of money? Well, I think he truly believed, but he also wanted to make a lot of money. I think he's one of these guys who see the, he's one of these guys who was very technically savvy. OK, very technically said, he's a smart guy. He knew how to use words, and how to get it out there and images and all that. OK, and what the liberal order does, it rewards creativity. OK, creative people mm. who produce things of value can move up. OK, that's why you got big tech in this country. That's why you got Silicon Valley. These guys think outside the box. Nobody checking their thinking except, you know, more wealthier people or occasionally the government. But this is what has given the United States a competitive edge with the rest of the world, because this creativity is allowed to go really unhindered. Now, that idea, the liberal order, the, 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 the Constitution, the First Amendment is part of the American people's identity. And, and Luce's obituary says he had the Constitution with him every day. And he mm. talked about it every day. And I think that's probably true from what I read. <coughs> I think maybe some of that smoke's coming over here now. I was just going to say. <laughs> you know, I don't know what's going on here. Sky does look a little little red. I mean, it looks like Mars in New York. I mean, that's yeah, incredible. It's, we, the, the, I don't know what you call it, parts per million or air quality index was, I think I was listening to CBS radio, the worst ever recorded. It was like up in the yeah. 400s, like the worst air quality ever recorded which is, <laughs> let's hope that doesn't get down to you. It was really weird, man. I So, so yeah, so let's hope it doesn't. But that is that is part of what the liberal order does. It, it, it encourages and allows for creativity. And it allows for the accumulation of wealth. It allows for the survival of the fittest in a social sense, like Herbert Spencer talked about. Okay, mm. that's what you've got going on in the liberal order. The guys who can produce, provide something of value, who can negotiate, um, life and be somebody great. If you can't, you know, and you got some deleterious aspects, beliefs, uh, physical conditions, if you're tied to the soil or friends or family or religion, you're going to get excluded. But if you can operate and negotiate all that and be creative and provide something of value and be of service to the people at the top, you can advance. So you get in this polarization of the people. And one thing that, um, oh, his name escapes me. I think it's Niall Ferguson. The economist, what, what he said is he said, people realized that with money, and this is, you know, middle ages, this, this realization started to get greater as, as the forms of money started to evolve. <clears throat> he says, with money, you can do anything. You can control everything, be everything, do whatever you want to do. So this was the way money, wealth, was the way to another life, different from a normal life. So I, I think it was a combination of both, you know, and that's what you have um, with a, a lot of the American identity. That having been said, this is this is kind of part of who we are. Yeah, we want success, but there's this conflict in the American heart. And it's this conflict, you know, between the natural law, which says I'm from this piece of dirt. I live here. These are my people. This is what I do. As opposed to, hey, I want to be somebody. I want to advance. 
And the idea of the American dream, this aspect, you know, I want to advance liberalism. I really like that aspect was really driven home, especially in the 30s with this guy, James Truslow Adams, who talked about the American dream, <laughs> which was just building on what was there before, because so many people came to America to create a new life for themselves where they could raise their family, where they could they could do what they wanted to do. OK. And so that's why they came here. And that was built upon that. But at the same time, there's a people who's tied to the ground and there is this call of the natural law in everybody's heart. Mm. Yeah. And there, there's something noble and, and, and good about wanting to make a better life for your family, uh, obviously. But what we've seen, the results of that in this particular system is just mammon, mammon worship. That's all it's been. And yeah, it's, it's unfortunate to see that because, you know, rising out of poverty or just being able to provide for your kids so your kids don't starve is obviously a, a necessary good. Um, yes. To see that devolve into what it's devolved into where, you know, a homeless person can have seven cell phones. It's just an absurd, you know, place to be. Well, well no, th that's exactly right. What you brought up is, is people, you know, there, there are fundamental rights, okay, that, that we have. These fundamental rights are not, uh, the sun's coming out. These fundamental rights are not um, as defined by American jurisprudence. These fundamental rights are things like the right to have a family, to conserve yourself, okay, the right to worship, the right to have your culture. Uh, these are the fundamental rights. They're set forth in the Catechism in Section 2211. The um, Law of Nations sets this forth. Uh, these are what you have to have. You have to have a, a family which materially and spiritually flourishes or benefits or is developed. And that is what development is. It requires the spiritual and the material. In America, what's happened is that in the public sphere, it's just the material development and the spiritual has been left to private. And that has broken people apart. People, people should be allowed, you know, to improve themselves and do better. But you can't do it in a society where we're all competitors. We're all at each other's throats. You have to do it with a sense of solidarity that we want good things for ourselves, for all of us. We do it as a group. And also, too, that we do it um, in, in, you know, with some boundaries. There got to be some boundaries here. and We have to live together uh, for things that make life worthwhile. Exactly right. And I'll give two more book references uh, for the audience. One is the Tan published the Popes Against Modern Errors, which is 16 papal documents that <clears throat> really speak to a lot of what uh, Mr. Wemhoff is talking about. And then also uh, Malachi Martin's Jesuits book, which I think is, um, I don't agree with everything that Malachi Martin talks about, but I think it's a very good book. I'd reference it if I'd remember to pull it off the shelf, but <laughs> people can, can look it up. But that it segues nicely into um, maybe we could enlighten the audience a little bit on who exactly are the Jesuits and how do they factor so prominently in what ends up becoming Vatican II? Well, the Jesuits were started with um, St. Ignatius Loyola from uh, in the 1500s. He was a soldier. He got wounded uh, while he's recuperating. He reads a lot of books about the saints. It changes his life forever. He starts the Jesuits. Uh, the Jesuits were very militant uh, because St. Ignatius was himself a soldier. And, you know, the, the military has a certain ethic, and so it has a certain virtue. And that's very good, uh, especially if you're going to convert people uh, and try to build societies. But when that gets turned against the church, that's very bad. <laughs> because that discipline and, that, and all of those traits can then be turned against uh, the font of truth, the source of truth. So anyway, the Jesuits... Uh, were very active during the uh, Reformation. They started something called the Counter-Reformation. They did a lot of work in trying to bring people back to the Catholic faith. They were very successful. Um, they uh, even tried to topple Queen Elizabeth I. Mm. They went into England, and many of them were martyred. Um, and from some of the big Jesuits, like um, Robert Bellarmine, St. Robert Bellarmine, one of the doctors of the church, you get many doctrines on the proper order of society uh, and the indirect power of the Pope over all the civil rulers. Uh, because that was really the issue in England at the time. Uh, who's in charge of the church in England? Is it the king or is it the Pope? Well, it's the Pope and Henry VIII said, no, it's the king. Um, so that was the big fight. Um, and so 
what you had then is you had the, the Jesuits became very effective over time. They, they really were very successful. Uh, finally, there were some complaints lodged against them uh, by various uh, rulers. Uh, I believe France was one of them, Portugal another. And then finally, they were suppressed in 1773, which means that they couldn't do their do their thing anymore. They were disbanded, you know, as, as an order. Mm. Um, what's interesting is there was a young Jesuit by the name of John Carroll at that time. And uh, he was the first Catholic bishop in America. So he was a Jesuit. Uh, and he was there at the time that uh, the, the order was disbanded. He had some very wealthy family members, uh, Daniel Carroll uh, and others, uh, Charles Carroll and others who were very wealthy. Americans, and they were Catholic in Maryland, and they participated in the revolution, and um, they were very much caught up with the ideas of the revolution. So uh, the Jesuits uh, came back in the early 1800s. Um, they proceeded then to work, uh, and then what happened is uh, there seems to have been in the 1900s, they seemed to go over to the dark side, if you will. They seemed mm -hmm. to go to work for the, the powerful private interests, and you had guys like John Courtney Murray, who represented that. Um, you had other guys who didn't. You had um, uh, Father John Ford, who, who, who seemed to uh, toe the line. He was a Jesuit. Um, you had uh, Father Lafarge, who, who talked about interracial justice. The verdict's still out on him, uh, in my mind. Uh, he made a lot of good comments about the church. He was very perceptive. He came from a long line of American blue bloods, if you will. Um, but he also had some ideas that I think were twisted and used by uh, the elites uh, to really cause uh, some confusion and to cause problems in the United States between the races. Um, right. now, now, whether he intended that or not, like I said, still looking at it, the jury's still out on that. Uh, but then you had the Jesuits basically come on the other side of the Catholic Church, and they seem to support whatever comes out of the American elites, the powerful private interests. And the, the American elites are part of a growing global elite. And at some, ex, some, some point, there is some conflict, you know, between these groups uh, right. of different parts of the world. It's like Mel Gibson in that movie, what was it, Conspiracy Theory? Oh, it's yeah. on the bus, you know, talking about, you know, it's united, but then they fight at one level. It's kind of like that, you know. Yeah, I actually just rewatched that last week. It's still so much fun. It's such a fun movie. It's a fun um, movie. <laughs> uh, so definitely, I want to. We we talked about Henry Luce. So Henry Luce was uh, the co-founder of Time Life, uh, Time Magazine, Life Magazine. And I think when uh, a lot of folks, you know, maybe a little bit older than me, but grew up with this Americana kind of Norman Rockwell style idea of what the 1930s, 40s, and 50s were. Uh, time life seems to encapsulate that very well in the minds of people. They can look at old time covers um, and, you know, person of the year is still a thing, right? Or I get, well, yeah, I guess it's still a thing. It's still a thing, yeah. Um, so, but it all, it turns out the whole thing is just propaganda and BS, right? I mean, it's, so it's very interesting to see in an age before the internet, before cell phones, before social media, uh, where there were only four, maybe four or five media companies, of course, all of them, are you know uh, founded and ran by people who come from you know intelligentsia backgrounds skull and bones backgrounds even though the new york times and time life might be in competition they're really started and run by the same people who are just jockeying for power but it's interesting to note, note and point out how this piece of americana that some folks may remember was just really a propaganda arm of henry luce and whoever was backing him well, yeah, they, they definitely had a, had a propaganda mission, <clears throat> but they also reached down and touched on uh, the material that's there. And this is where we come into C.D. Jackson. Mm -hmm. C.D. Jackson said, you know, the best type of, he said, there's no such thing as psyops. He said, he said, but, you know, he taught psyops, right. but, but he said, basically it's political warfare, right? <clears throat> and he said, what you do is you deal with what's there, the events there, and you just spin them. And so what Luce and others did is they looked at this base, this American base. And, and I think in large measure, yes, there was an American ethnicity. There is an American identity in large measure. It's been eroded in our lifetime a great deal. OK, but it was stronger, at, at least in my youth. I mean, you know, I I was born in 57. 
you know, kind of watching uh, a lot of John Wayne movies and a lot of Westerns and stuff like that. So this American identity, the basic roots, the basic elements were there. And so, yes, you had crafted um, uh, a version of that identity. They crafted this identity that we all kind of hearken to and that we could accept. OK, the elites at one time in this country were not that directly averse <laughs> to the people. OK, they kind of had some solidarity with the American people more so than they do now. Um, that's for sure. Um, but they, they built on this identity that was there. And so they created these images in our mind. And that's kind of who we, we were. And then they broke them down over time, you know. Uh, the, guy, the guy who comes to mind is is John Wayne. You know, John mm-hmm. Wayne, he represent. we just celebrated his 108th birthday or whatever. You know, it just, he was he was the American male. He was strong. He was individualistic, but collaborative. He always was on the good side. You could hear every word this guy spoke. And believe me, when you get older, that's important. You would understand everything he said. So, you know, this is the guy that people identified with. This is the American male. And this was the Western. This was the, 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 the ultimate American identity. And then what you had is you had, you know, Midnight Cowboy, you know, with, with the, the homosexuals coming in the late 60s. And the, sure. I started to see that identity get chipped away. Best, and, best Picture win, right? The Academy Awards, I think. Didn't that win Best I think Picture? It did. Yeah. I think it did. yeah. Oh, of course. Because the Hollywood, the cultural elites and their, their backers and the financial elites, you know, started to betray the American people. And it was a long-term plan. And I think it began in the 1940s. I think they began to betray us then, if not before. Yeah, it's... I should it stop. became obvious in the 40s. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should stop saying it's amazing all the time, but it's, I guess, amazing that, that, you know, when you look into not just Hollywood, how much the CIA, how much intelligence agencies influence movies and TV programs and were... Right. Um, War of the Worlds or The Day the Earth Stood Still, how much they've influenced, you know, o- only when the movies are backing their agenda, right? I mean, The Day the Earth Stood Still, what was the the whole goal of that? Was a one world government was going to prevent the aliens from destroying everybody, right? <laughs> so the propaganda sneaks in there. Um, I've just read uh, Weird Scenes from the Canyon, which is about uh, Laurel Canyon and the kind of hippie music scene in the, the, the early 60s that was all essentially orchestrated by military and, and intelligence agencies. Um, so it, it's an interesting segue because, you know, we, we need to get into Vatican II. How, how does the intelligence apparatus play into what eventually ends up happening? Because the, the way I remember it or the way I understand it, uh, Pope John XXIII uh, becomes Pope in 1958 after uh, Pius XII, and he just sort of decides to call a council. You know, it, it I can't seem to figure out what his reasoning was for doing that other than maybe just having a good um, historical remembrance of him. Uh, but it's, I think it's important to tie in exactly what's going on in the intel- intelligence agencies right now and how they're going to, they're going to infiltrate this whole process. Let me, that's a very good question. Let me back up just a little bit. <clears throat> so, so CD Jackson talked about political warfare. You got to work with what's there. So, so when they fashion these identities, okay, normally mm-hmm. I think identity grows up from the ground, but, but when you get the media, the mass media, you can really start to, f- to tweak this identity, to tweak these basic substances of an identity into something else that you want or to attack it or whatever. Okay. That, that's number one. Number two, you, you know, you always got to understand that anytime anybody says something or writes something or publishes something, they're telling you what they want you to think. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's just the way human communication works. Okay. Now that takes us into Vatican II. So Vatican II, uh, why did John the 23rd call it? He, uh, my research showed that he called it because we want to basically, and I got it in one of my summaries. Um, It's really a good quote. Let's see if I can find it real quick because it actually is a very good quote. Um, He said an ecumenical council to correspond and to correspond, rather, to the needs of the present times. Um, and so what I found is was the prosecu- it was the fight the persecution in communist countries and to strengthen the spiritual dimension of life, because I think that he and others thought that 
we that the people of the world were being sifted. They're being ground between the Caribbean and the Scylla, you know, of this Soviet monolithic communism and this liberal West, you know, this universal individualism and this universal communitarianism. And both were devoid of God. Both were devoid of God. And the world was being shifted and crushed by this. So I think he tried to come on out and present something, a way to deal uh, with this thing. Well, you know, the intelligence communities, uh, the American intelligence communities, the, the governments of the world, but especially the American intelligence community, is going to take this as an opportunity. I, I mean, yeah, you know, sometimes you don't have to make your breaks. You just wait for the break, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what the Americans did. But the American intelligence was so good, was so good as to what was happening in the church that in August of 1956, they knew who the next two popes were going to be. Yeah. They knew who they were going to be. That's because the CIA has an office next to the Holy Spirit. And it's tapped the Holy Spirit's uh, room. Okay, that's a little, a little hyperbole there. But the American intelligence is really good. And American intelligence worked through a guy called Klaus Dorn. Klaus Dorn worked for time and for the CIA. And he was an anti-Nazi. And so what he did, he suffered from polio. So what he did is he knew everybody in Rome, knew everybody in the capitals of Europe, and he knew the way the wind was blowing in the Vatican. And the Americans wanted Montini, who was Paul VI, because they thought he'd be more friendly to them because he had promoted something called Prodeo, when Prodeo University was funded and promoted by the CIA and the OSS. And mm -hmm. it took all the professionals who went from the third world and it taught them that the American system of organization is the best. Americanism is the way to go. And so that's what, that's what Prodeo was about. And so they wanted Paul VI. Well, Paul VI disappointed them when he finally got in, when he finally got in. But what Klaus Dorn in his memo in the Library of Congress says, he says, well, the next Pope is going to be um, the Roncalli and then, you know, and then, you know, Montini. It was incredible. So, so this is what the Vatican II is starting. And it's starting in the shadow of World War II. This is 17 years after the end of World War II. You got this monolithic, horrific Soviet Union where Christians are being horribly per persecuted. Uh, the church is being suppressed. Bad stuff is going on. And so the church is coming into this environment and starting this council. And, and so it has to deal with the world that it's facing. It's basically a godless world. And so then that's when the Vatican Council started. Um, right away, the press did this battle between the American progressives and the reactionaries, at least in the American press. It was depicted that way from the very beginning. The American press uh, was able to get a foot in the Vatican during this council because they promised this telsat live broadcast of this uh, big event, which happens you know, every couple hundred years in the church. And that was a big deal. It's like the first time ever people are watching live events. I remember the black and white TV, really bad image. I mean, it's unbelievable today. People would say there's something wrong with their TV. But we used to watch that. Great, you know, you can see what's actually going on. And so this is what happened. And so the Catholic Church was depicted in the press as having this big fight. And the Catholic prelates didn't like that. And they were upset about this. And that was the first session was 60. By 1963, the Catholic pushed back with Intermerifica. Intermerifica is one of the first two documents to come out, deal with social communication. So they, they were thinking ahead to social media. They were thinking of YouTube 60 years ago. They were saying, you got to do certain things when you have social communications. One of them is you got to tell the truth, okay? And you got to be by people who know what the heck they're doing, okay? But they also set out a vision for society that requires that in order to have proper culture, remember culture is really important to the family, important to the nation. It's one of those fundamental rights that are protected and defended for a human life to be fully developed. You have to have right culture, proper culture, not crap, but proper culture, okay? So in order to do that, you know what? The social communication plays its role. So you gotta have people who are doing what they're doing, who are conscientious, who follow the moral order. And in paragraph six, of Intermerifica, it says every society, we decree, every society has got to follow the moral order. That's, you know, at least the natural law. That's at least the Decalogue. you got to follow that. Well, that's not the case in America. 
I mean, you had this, this culture that kind of bumped along. Everybody kind of understood it. But then it started to get broken apart with Everson in 47 when they said, no, you can't have churches at the local level. Separate your church and stay. We can't talk about that. Well, there you go. Boom. There goes the first commandment, right? Boop, right out the window. Okay. So now you've got a situation where, where the Catholic bishops, the, 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 the council fathers are wise to it. They get it. And Fenton, Monsignor Joseph Fenton, was sitting there with his little magazine, American Ecclesiastical Review, and he was writing and saying, it's very clear, in 1961, he's saying, it's very clear there's a worldwide conspiracy against our doctrine. It is very clear this is what's going on. They're attacking our doctrine. So then the Vatican uh, Council came out with Intermerifica, and they said the church and state have got to work together in controlling the media. No way. The Americanists didn't want that. The Americans didn't want that. That's when John Courtney Murray got up. Even I think Daniel Liu got up and he said, this is wrong. Bishop Daniel Liu, this is wrong. No, you're going to stifle people. You can't have this. This is against the liberal order. And of course, they were disregarded. Intermerifica passed. People were really upset about that in the American media. And but it was a big victory for the church and a big victory for the Catholic faith because it set forth what you're supposed to have in society. I mean, that was an amazing victory, which most people have just simply forgotten or they don't understand it or they don't want to implement it because it requires church and state working together to control the media and limiting the voices to really perhaps just a few that really know what they're talking about and also to controlling the culture for the benefit of everyone. Yeah, and, and this is not a foreign idea in the East either. I mean, the idea of Byzantium and Sinfonia is is echoed throughout West and East. I mean, it's the, the idea that one would operate without the other is a modernist invention. It's not a it's not a Christian invention. Right. And there's a couple of things to point out here. Uh, I would make the case that, and I, th I think this is pretty easy to argue, that even the idea of free speech itself is not really a Christian value. I mean, it, it's in a way it's beneficial to Christians to have free speech. It's also not beneficial for Christians to have free speech when dissenting and opposing groups have free speech. So I, I would say it's helpful in some cases, but I, I I've heard people make the case that it's it's christian in nature I, I don't know if i buy that um and the other point i would make is people who are somewhat offended or weirded out by the idea that the church would influence media or would influence the state yeah. but let's, we'll just take media they'll say well no we need a free press we can't have the press being influenced by the church as if the press isn't influenced by something all the time right <laughs> or started by the very people who are trying to influence you that there is this neutral space that isn't going to be occupied by either good or evil. It just sort of exists separate from the divine order, the spiritual realm. Um, is is sort of a kind of kind of a tough position for someone to hold when they really think about it. I mean, especially the same people who complain about how the media is constantly controlling them, but somehow we can't have the Christian Church uh, putting a check on the media. Like it's it's a they're they're two opposing views that are in tension with each other. They're contradictory. <laughs> that's right. No, you 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 see the issue. That's really great. That really is because that's absolutely right. <clears throat> and I would submit to you that the Christian view um, of free speech is not the American view. Mm. The Christian view, at best, at best, is to say you know we we can talk and talk of truth, or we can talk and let our needs be known to the governing authorities, but we can't spread lies about people or dissension or, or bad ideas. You know, you have to protect truth. You have to protect the faith. Okay. And that was something the church has always understood. It still understands and it's doctrine. You know, we need to talk about doctrine and what the people think. They're two different things, but the doctrine has always said, you have to protect the faithful. You have to protect the religion. You can't let it get corrupted. You bring up a good point too. The original social engineering, in my view, people talk about social engineering in America in the last 50 years. The original social engineering is the First Amendment. Mm. The original mm. social engineering, okay? And what the founders were, were what Jefferson did, uh, not all of them, but, but Jefferson certainly did. What he did is he tried to root out the common law from American jurisprudence because the common law came from Blackstone and it came from the British and that was a part of history, you know, with the Protestant influence, canon law, ecclesiastical law, and just local law. So he tried to get rid of all mention of God, all sense of religion. 
to keep up, to, to maintain this idea of freedom, you know, this ideology of the First Amendment. So a lot of that has been rooted out over time. Now, <clears throat> the United States government engaged in a program. It did. It was called the Doctrinal Warfare Program to actually get people to accept the American system, a social organization, the First Amendment, the free speech, uh, not hindered by the government, not hindered by this, by by the church, get free speech as the ideal, free press as the ideal. Okay, and that program became known as PSB uh, Delta Thirty Three, and they worked on that from really, really nineteen fifty one to nineteen fifty three. One of the key guys leading that was a guy by the name of Doctor uh, Lilly. Okay, Doctor. Uh, What's his first name? I forget his first name. Isn't that something? Um, Edward Lilly. Okay, Edward Lilly. Uh, Edward Lilly was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. He was a Catholic. He was the guy coming up with the idea to exploit divergencies and to exploit differences in belief systems that opposed the American system of social organization. Everybody thought it was Soviet Union, but it was wide open. It was a wide open mandate that allowed them to go after all belief systems. Mm -hmm. And if in and in the archives at the Eisenhower archives, you will find plans to penetrate not only the Catholic Church, but but to penetrate by country the religions, you know, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Muslims, and so forth. By country, they limit, they they list who's there and what the assessment is. Okay, so Lilly developed this in the the early 1950s. He developed this. And he was a very wealthy Catholic and a professor at Catholic University. He came from a very good family. So he helped to develop this. And so what you had is you had the Catholic elites really go along with this plan to subvert their own church's teaching um, and to keep it from having any sort of effect. Um, and that would have required control of what was said uh, by the church and the state working in conjunction uh, to make sure that morals are protected because the church and the state and the state has a obligation to maintain the moral order and has an obligation to keep good morals. And the guys they needed during the Cold War was Francisco Franco in Spain and Salazar in Portugal. They hated mm -hmm. these guys. Yeah, and I was going to bring that up in, in Italy as well <clears throat> to say that, you know, there, there are uh, differing Catholic states at this time, right? So we word it that way. So you have, like you just mentioned, Portugal, Spain, especially Franco. And then you have the more, what, Germany would be one of them, uh, some of the Northern European countries, which are um, somewhat opposed. So you have international kind of battling of these ideas. <clears throat> yeah, that's... <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of the point. Like, it, there's... There are uh, Catholic states at this time that are very comfortable being called that. And then there are Catholic states at this time who are not comfortable. And so you have another battleground, which it's not just the modernists versus the traditionalists within the Vatican or within the American uh, landscape, but also these other nation states in Europe that have completely different ideas about how they want their, their own nation to be governed. I'll, I'll let you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. That, that was Spartacus. He's my dog. He, uh, <clears throat> he kind of runs the neighborhood. Of course. So he knows <laughs> who's coming up and who isn't, uh, you know, and he even keeps an eye on what's going on uh, at the neighbors. Yep. You're a good boy. Um, and uh, he's, he's a good little dog. Yeah. Uh, but um, he, yeah, that's right. You have different factions within the Catholics. You have different factions within all these countries. They're all played off against each other. It goes back to my question. You have to have a vision of what is good for the people, and you have to know who you are. You have to have, have your identity. Um, and, and I think that is absolutely critical, and that is what the uh, private, powerful private interests have been able to do. They play the different groups off against each other, uh, and they can use anything and everything to do that. I mean, they can use the religions like they're doing in, in the Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, they can use the nationalities like they did, you know, leading up to World War I. Um, they use all of that stuff. Um, they can use, you know, the good to do evil. So the, you have to know who you're dealing with and who's behind the curtain. And you have to understand who's really in charge. And, and that's why the First Amendment has kept, you know, these powerful private interests uh, who are unknown to most people in charge. And it's mm -hmm. hard to defend against them. Now, you, you make the case in the book, which you really don't see made very many places. And that's that 
the result of Vatican II, what comes out of Vatican II, is pretty much a victory for the Roman Catholic Church. Um, however, that's not how almost everyone sees it. And you no. explain this in the book. It's it's obvious you don't leave us hanging in the book. You do explain the the consequences and the decades after Vatican II. So maybe uh, for people who are listening who are are maybe they were raised Roman Catholic, like I was raised Roman Catholic. Um, and you know, I, I, we had the guitar mass, right? So maybe we don't, a lot of people don't think that the Catholic church was victorious because we're not seeing those fruits particularly play out in Novus Ordo today. So yeah. Can you get, get into a little bit of uh, how you see it that way? Yeah. I get into a lot of trouble for saying that. A lot of people look at me like, are you nuts? And the more I read those, uh, you know, the more I read Gaudium at space, um, the more I read Interborifica, the more I read Dignus Azumani, I see what they were doing. Um, <clears throat> Catholic doctrine wasn't changed. The doctrine has stayed the same. I mean, Dignus Azumani, right at the beginning, says our traditional doctrine is the same. We're not changing anything. We're just saying we have constitutions, and this is what you have to do. And this concept of the common good, okay, the sum total of those conditions, material and spiritual, that make it more efficacious for people to realize their vocation, which is to go to heaven. This was really powerful. And this idea of the common good was reinforced in Gaudium at Space, and it's in the Catechism. It's a powerful tool that can be used by, by Catholics and other like-minded and good faith and goodwill to properly order society. And the idea of common good is even mentioned by Professor Denis in his latest book, okay, that just came out. Because the common good is the whole person. This is the idea that the church got out there. And it got it out on paper. Now, it was all spun. And you you know, you just you just know the enemies of the church were really PO'd after the council. Because I, I talk about it. Some of their the Protestant leaders just got up and they said, well, this is going to be an ongoing process of getting the church into the 20th century. Well, that means they lost. When they're saying stuff like that, they're looking at the documents. They're saying, nah, you know, they didn't do what we wanted. But you had the media and you had um, apparatchiks in the Catholic church, you had Americanists in the Catholic church that were going to spin this, okay? And they were going to spin these documents. And we didn't know any better. Growing up in the 60s and 70s, we didn't know any better, Okay. And so we got these, like you said, guitar masses. We had these masses at Notre Dame where you sat around like Indians on the ground, you know, and the priests, you know, wore some strange clothing. And it's like, you know, I mean, well, everybody lost their faith from that, okay? Because we don't know what's going on. This doesn't make any sense. It's not applicable. You had you had the whole, the, the religious classes and the Catholic high schools and the colleges were, you know, black and white photos of half-filled potholes. Well, hmm. what's that supposed to mean? You know, you're talking about these general concepts of love and friendship. What does that mean? Talk about our history. Talk about who we are. We were cut off from who we were. We were cut off from the doctrine, but not, but not by the church. It was just by the apparatchiks in the church that had the approval of the church. Okay. So finally, what happened is the Vatican II documents were pretty badly twisted until about 1975, when John Cardinal Wright um, got this guy, Father Flannery, a very dog-eared copy. And said, write these documents and take away all the all the discussion, all the all the kibitz and all the <coughs> commentary from these Americanists and just put the basic ideas down. And that's what happened. So now you got the basic that Flannery version, and that is the model, uh, because before that was the Abbott version and other versions. Um, but the Flannery version takes out all of the opinion making of all the theologians who had turned against the church's doctrine and who wanted to twist these doc documents. Well, in the meantime, you still had a lot of prelates and a lot of priests in the Catholic church twist these documents. Okay. And they twisted them in a way that was bad for all of us. The doctrine stayed the same. And what happened is you had the, the, the priests and, and a lot of the laity who went along with another interpretation of the documents uh, uh, which was harmful to people. And it led to ultimately the subversion of the Franco regime. Uh, and ultimately, I, I think it led to the subversion of the Salazar regime in 74. Um, and then, uh, you know, by the 80s, Italy was being undermined too, because you had these people with this wrong, purposely erroneous idea 
of these documents. They were using them. Uh, but if you actually look at the document, and I'm not, I am not, like I said before, look, ecclesiology and liturgy, you know, I, I'm not your guy. But I do know there's a big conflict in the church, right, on liturgy between traditional Latin mass and Novus Ordo. This big conflict seems to suck a lot of energy out of the room, mm -hmm. and people are divided into these camps, and oftentimes they don't see the bigger picture uh, of how we should be going out in the world and reforming the societies and working together. So this conflict divides the Catholics, okay, and it makes it almost impossible to cooperate at a larger scale uh, to do better things. But so what you had is you had these ideas. The Catholic doctrine did remain the same. Nothing was overturned. It was just, in many ways, it was put out there in a way that um, you had to know what the Catholic faith was. Once you read it, then you could dig deeper and explain it. But it was put out in a way that supposedly a lot of average people could understand and hearken to. Like Gaudium at Space talks about the importance of the family and mm -hmm. the importance of right culture, and the importance of a proper international order. It recognizes ethnicities, it recognizes races, and it recognizes nations, and it says this is how we got to work together for the development of people sp spiritually and physically and materially. And this is carried forward in the 1997 catechism, 1997. This is carried forward. So the church didn't say, well, we're going to throw all this stuff out and we're going to start over. No, the church... In a way, you could say they kind of repackaged it in this epideictic language in some ways, and then that was used by the enemies of the church to attack the church. Was that wise? Well, I, I don't know, you know, but I, maybe it wasn't all that wise, but that's, you know, that's what we have. Uh, and, and I can see how they were um, making the case for a more, um, a, for an appeal to a more pedestrian crowd in those documents. I can see how they were doing that. Um, I can see how they were making these documents in a way so people could take them as a starting point and do further research into what, you know, the Catholic doctrine was. You see the law of nations in, in those documents. You see the Catholic doctrine uh, of the one true church, all of those nations, the right order of society with the common good. You see it in there. Uh, so th that's my, um, that's my approach. And it has gotten me a uh, a little bit of notoriety. <laughs> well, you um, <clears throat> re reading through the book, e even if I didn't, if I didn't know anything about any of this, there are essentially a couple of, I guess you call them heroes in the book, right? They're set as the uh, the protagonists, really, in a lot of this, and it's uh, Francis Connell and um, uh, Joseph Fenton, right? I think those are the two, if I'm getting the first names right, that are really they're really laid out in the narrative as you know trying to do anything they can to appeal to whomever they can appeal to and make whatever argument they can make against this push to modernize the church. And um, in many cases, just as a narrative, um, they're falling on deaf ears. And and it, it's, like I said, from a narrative structure, it's frustrating because you you start to identify with who you see as the protagonist of the story and to see them you know, strive so hard for what they truly believed in and find so much resistance or just maybe ambivalence in a lot of ways. Or you know, seeing like Oti Otiviani um, kind of slowly succumb to the pressure over time. It's a, it's a very well laid out story from a narrative point of view. And, and I find those two particular individuals um, were very well portrayed in a, in a flattering light for sure. Yeah, I, I think they were the heroes uh, as well as Monsignor Shea. I think these guys were really <clears throat> the heroes of this fight. Um, they just kept, you know, they kept going until they dropped. I mean, literally, literally, just kept yeah. going until they drop. Um, and, and I think I think Father Connell should be a saint of the Catholic Church. Uh, there was an effort started in 1981, but that didn't seem to go very far. Um, he was really a very powerful force at the council, but you just don't hear about him. Monsignor Fenton was another guy. He was a little bit irascible from what I read. Um, yeah, he was a character. Um and he would fire back at people. I remember reading reading one letter. So I read the letter that came to him, and it was critical. And uh, Monsignor Fenton wrote back, and he said, you know, how dare you write such a nasty letter to a man you don't even know? <laughs> you know? And, and it, it, I think people back then had a sense of, of civility towards each other. And I think that they drew the line more readily. I mean, now you get... 
you get emails, you get letters. They don't, they don't say dear Dave anymore. Dear Mr. Wemhoff. It's just Mr. Wemhoff, you know, that's it. That's what you yeah, well, Okay. You know, so, um, you, you, these guys fought the good fight. They appealed. <clears throat> yeah. Ottaviani helped them out. There were other prelates that kind of helped them out in Rome. Um, Connell and Fenton definitely Fenton's at magazine, American Ecclesiastical Review was really the only light out there mm. that, that, that kept broadcasting in the United States, um, the Catholic doctrine on church and state and other matters. Um, but, but Connell always seemed to have a good audience with the people in the pews. And so I remark in the book, you know, there, there seems like a dichotomy in the way the church talked to the world, you know, one, one, one side of his mouth to talk to the people in the pews who are the ordinary people, the day-to-day -day people, you know, we're, we're the people who try to make things work. We need the Catholic faith. Uh, we need right order uh, to protect ourselves, to allow us to, to, to flourish as individuals, you know, to, to allow us to develop and, and uh, spiritually protect us. We need the Catholic faith. Um, we need that. Okay. The, uh, the people at the top were spoken to, uh, the rich people were spoken to, by a different crowd. And even uh, Father Lafarge wrote a letter October 14, 1955 to Murray. He said, you know, the problem with the Catholic Church is, you know, the prelates listen to the rich people. They're beholden to the rich. I mean, he, he just wrote that out there in, in plain language. And Lafarge was the guy who wrote, who worked with the blacks and came up with this idea of interracial justice. But he says, this is the reality of what you're dealing with. And that's what you had with the Jesuits. The Jesuits catered to the upper classes at the time, the WASP upper class, uh, especially in New England. Um, and um, they were always around the WASP upper class. They wanted to hear what they had to say. And so this is the the, the struggle you had um, in the church. And unfortunately, um, you know, the ideas of, of Father Connell um, did not seem to win out. But you can still see, as I detail my book, how his ideas uh, were protected uh, because there was a conflict in the church between Connell and uh, Murray. You know, is it just the natural law or is it the divine positive law as the ideal? And you can see how that was resolved. I think it's chapter 118 of my book, volume two, where I talk about how I view the resolution of that conflict with Dignitas Humani and other documents from Vatican II. Uh, so I think that that is what, um, what played out. It's very interesting uh, because they asked in 1959, they asked the Catholics all around the world, what, are, what do you think is the big, what are the big topics? And, um, uh, you know, Father Connell said, well, there are four of them. There's only two that are really important. One of them was, um, you know, the whole idea of what is the, the ideal form of social organization? Is it the natural law or the divine positive law? And then the second one was, we need an international organization that listens to the Pope, you know, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and he said, uh, that is, that is the, those are the two issues because the world was getting closer. The council fathers knew we were all getting closer with the United Nations, with everything that was going on after World War II. And so they knew that this world is tending towards greater unity. And uh, Paul, uh, Pius XII saw that. He talked about it in 1953 with Chai Racy, uh, where he says, look, we're tending towards this unity and we need to address this issue of how we're going to get along. And so that is part of the reason for the Vatican II documents that issue. I, I agree. Some of that language is ambiguous, but you have to know the Catholic faith to explain it to people. Hmm. Mm, yeah, it's a good point. Um, one thing I was well, a couple of things I wanted to touch on. I made like an after list just in case we had some time. And one of them is the arguments that are made at the council concerning um, the uh, the views of, let's say, the French revolutionary ethos versus the American revolutionary ethos as an argument for uh, church state separation. Can you expand on that a little bit? Let people know what exactly what that means. Yeah, they were saying the American the American Revolution was a conservation of the Catholic tradition. Mm. <laughs> That's the sum total of it. No, it wasn't. It was a complete break. I, I mean, it's this is you know, there's the holding up an apple and saying this is an orange. It was a, it was a complete break. It was it was it was the diarchy. We're keeping in place the diarchy. You know, this idea of the two different realms of church and state. You know, well. They're supposed to cooperate with each other and collaborate with each other. And Murray understood that. He knew that. And after the council by 1966, a year later, he was saying, 
yeah, I don't know what we unleashed here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's uh, it's unfortunate that really all the main players in the story, as you present it, really passed away within a couple of years. Of, it's amazing. And, and, and so we'll, we don't really have any way of knowing what they would have thought 40 years later. Or 50, right. or 50 or sorry, for, uh, sev, you know, 70 years. Later. years yeah. Yeah. 60, yeah. Um, it's, yeah super- it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, they all died within months of each other, just about, <laughs> except, except for Fenton, who died in 69, and then the Shea died in 1990. He actually lived a long time. That's true. That's true. Um, so one one person I, I didn't really expect to come up in the story, and I'm, I'm glad you hit on him because he's an interesting fellow, is uh, Gerald Hurd. And <laughs> he uh, he's I'm familiar with him because I know he, well, obviously of the LSD experience thing that has going on, but also um, because he was so crucial, I believe, in creating Esalen, which is going to be a topic of a future show. We're going to talk into the, the Esalen Institute, but his... Um, his relationship with science fiction writers, like you mentioned, Ray Bradbury and Aldous Huxley. And we've talked about Brave New World probably every episode on the show we've done in the last year because, sorry, libertarians, he is not warning you about what's to come. He's telling you exactly what is going to happen to you, and he's in favor of it. So, uh, yeah, mention or talk a little bit about Gerald Hurd and his influence on the Looses, on um, uh, John Courtney Murray as well. Well, I'm just tickled pink, you know, that that, that you picked up. Uh, on Gerald Hurd. He's a huge figure. Figure, They say he's one of the most influential people of the 20th century, if not mm-hmm. the most influential. He he actually normalized. He's responsible for normalizing homosexuality. Quite literally. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he was a homosexual himself. So he normalized this. He, he had great influence of the cultural elites. And uh, he made Ray Bradbury, as you said. He's, he's from Northern Ireland. He um, administered a state by a man of uh, uh, of a, of a man by the name of Plunkett, I believe, Lord Plunkett. Uh, and uh, that's how he was able to do a lot of things he was able to do. He came to the United States. The FBI tracked him for a while. They didn't know if he was loyal or not. Uh, he fell in with the Looses. I don't recall exactly now how he fell in with the Looses, but I think it was, it was uh, it may have been through Claire who converted to Catholicism. Um, but, at, but it was in the 1940s. And he was a regular at the Looses' house. Um, they, they did LSD together. Um, Claire's notes record. Claire Booth Luce was a was a Protestant. She became a Catholic. Became a congressman. Was the wife of of Henry Luce, um, and um, um, and she was very close with her and with Luce and with John Courtney Murray. Um, we should probably talk about that too. But uh, anyways, uh, <laughs> Heard got them on LSD. Heard's ideas they promoted. He was promoted in the pages of time as somebody, you know, was really leading the new wave of, of culture. Uh, Trabuco Canyon, he started uh, uh, a school out there, Esalen, of course, um, and he was all involved in, in all of that. And he was very um, much in touch with Murray. Um, and oftentimes Murray and Heard and the Losers would visit. In Christmas of 1964, they were talking about Vatican II Council together, and Murray apparently spilled his guts about how things are changing in the church, and uh, Heard wrote about it, you know, wrote, wrote to his friends about it. He said, yeah, church is changing, um, and uh, he was uh, a deconstructor. He was there to make sure society would transform and atomize and break apart. He was a very influential person. At the time I did the book, there was only one biography about him, between the pigeonholes that had just come out. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, and then there were other, you know, sources of information I was able to tap into. Uh, but he was a guy who had enormous influences uh, on and on society at large. Um, and, you know, he still does with the normalization of homosexuality. Oh, I mean, it, it's amazing how many different avenues he's influenced over the years. And I, I wanted to ask you, because you brought up, um, so the, the edition I have of the book is 2022. When was the first edition published? What the, the, fir- the first edition came out in 2015. Oh. Um, let me say something re- really quick um, about her before I forget this. He gave a speech in Idlewild, California, okay, in 1956. And, he's, and he basically said, on the businessmen. I mean, all, all the institutions were letting him in. All, all the Ivy League, the big institutions were letting him in. And he was talking and he said, the businessman is really the determiner of morality. Mm. That's what he said. That was his speech. This was the big cultural guru, right? And he said, the businessman determines morality. Yeah. Well, I mean, as it turns out, he's, um, you know, whether it's 
objectively true or not, at least seems subjectively true, right? That 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 sort of is how it played out. I think uh, that's right. So I have one last point I wanted to get your opinion on, and then I'll let you close out with anything you think we might may have missed. And that's uh, your thoughts on uh, movements like SSPX, SSPV, <laughs> set of a contism. Uh, what do you what are your thoughts on those movements and their maybe their veracity or how you know effective they may be or even if they should even exist at all you know i'm probably the wrong guy to ask about that stuff i mean i i i stay i try to stay within my lane um and you know my lane is is issues of social governance i'm trained as a lawyer <clears throat> you know um that's what i know and that that implicates economics uh law and governance and issues of organization. And so, and that's what I taught. I taught these, these topics. I taught con law with constitutional law is about how you order society. Um, you know, I taught business law, employment law, criminal law, criminal procedure, all that stuff. So these are my areas, uh, ecclesi ecclesia issues of ecclesiology, um, you know, issues of one group or another. I, I really can't, you know, give you a good opinion except to stay, Say I look at this, and I and I very quickly look at what's going on in those circles and the Catholic circles, and I see this conflict, you know, this constant conflict. And anytime that there is a difference or there's a a seam, you know, in in the fabric, anytime that there's a, a difference of opinion, you know, like Henry Luce and the American leadership in the early 20th century saw that there was a divide in the church. There were the Americanists and then there were the, the Catholics. Anytime there's that division, it's going to get exploited. Mm. It's going to get exploited. So I, I don't know whether in the right or wrong, it's going to get exploited and it's going to weaken the mission of the church at, at all at, in general. And most importantly, <coughs> it's going to weaken the message and uh, greatly lessen um, the validity of what the church has to say. You know, um, uh, John Epstein says uh, he was an Englishman, lived from 1895 to about 1988. Everything he wrote had a Neil Opstein imprimatur, everything this guy wrote. He wrote a book in 1935 called uh, The Catholic Tradition and the Law of Nations. Um, it was recognized by James Brown Scott as one of the greatest works ever. He got a, John Epstein got a, got a papal medal for writing this book people metal for mm. writing this book okay everything he wrote was was neil opsat imprimatur because it laid out the catholic doctrine and the law of nations okay um 35 and but he wrote a number of articles one of the articles he said um is in he said the divine law okay the importance of the divine law in people's lives really declined with protestantism humanism and materialism hmm. um charles beard fellow hoosier you know who went and taught out there at columbia university um you know he wrote in the early part of the 1930s he wrote his big book on the epic history of the american people and i think it's really right and he said um what you had happen okay is you had in the world, in the Western civilization, you had religion lose credibility with mm. the Protestant revolt. It, it lost credibility because faith and reason got separated. And then what happened is you had the development of pseudo reason, of science, pseudoscience, that delivered the goods. And he said, <clears throat> by the 1600s, Religion couldn't deliver the goods anymore to people. Okay. People were turning to science <clears throat> and to a secularism to give them the goods of life. And they couldn't count on the churches anymore. And even the American founders, you know, James Madison, ultimately, he was a brilliant guy. Okay. And a very smart man. And when I say that, that that's an assessment of his abilities. <clears throat> he wrote in 1774, he said, you know, this is crazy. You go, you go to Richmond and you got all these religions squabbling about their different privileges. We got to do away with this. We got to get religious liberty. Like you guys got up in Pennsylvania hmm. because if you guys have, because then we won't have to deal with this stuff and they're not going to hinder what we do in the government 
and we're, they're not going to hinder what we do in private life. Because you see, when you have a state base or a state sponsored religion or your state recognized religion, religion and church, you have a real check on the appetites of the powerful private interests. This was something Luce and Murray understood and talked about. This was something that they knew in societies like Spain, Catholic countries, where there was this tension. They put it in terms of a tension. You know, they couldn't do everything they wanted to do because there were these moral factors pushing on them. So mm. this is what you had that that happened. And this is this is kind of what we are living through as a result of this process. Well, the, yeah, you're right. And the, and the reason I brought it up is because it seems like it seems clear to me, but at least the dawning of this is is apparent that um, Francis doesn't want there to be a traditional Latin mass anymore. And that it seems to me that he's going to try to somehow get rid of that under penalty of excommunication. Now, I, I don't obviously I I only have what I see and read. Uh, I'm not there. You might know better than I do. Uh, I think that would be a hugely disruptive move on his part for but it doesn't seem like there's anything that he feels like he can't do you know um i've heard people say that he's making it harder uh for the latin mass um i i can't you know other than what i've heard that's really all i can say i mean um I, i'm really not your guy on that mm. i'm just saying there's this d division this fight in the church and it's sucking a lot of air out of the room. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's a fear. Well, you know, from just an, an outsider point of view or just having been through this for decades um, that I, I mean, where does, where you're, you're probably going to say it's not your area of expertise, but where do you think the church needs to go to sort of distance itself? Maybe from, I mean, there's, there's stuff with Pope Francis that I, I, I just don't know how people can reconcile themselves to it you know you know it's got to be frustrating and awful because it's so obvious the tradition it wasn't so obvious with with john paul ii it wasn't so obvious with benedict um but it's just so glaring now with this guy that i, I mean it's hard to even know how to put the words into a sentence to describe it to you that's like that's how baffling it is to me well, it really shocked me when in May of 2016, he said, you know, secular governments are the way to go. Union of church and state isn't a good idea. Well, I, that, that kind of shocked me. But remember, <clears throat> the church is, is what, 2,000 years old? You know, hmm. I, I mean, um, it's been through some pretty hard times. And, and Christ said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there have been some. Popes that haven't been good over the years. Some people say that Francis is worse than others because he's questioning the doctrine. But, you know, a lot of what he says, from what I can see, he hasn't put in an encyclical that we're bound to believe, or he hasn't written it into doctrine that we're bound to believe. And that's the Holy Spirit at work. In many ways, what you're seeing is the power of the Holy Spirit, keeping the doctrine pure, while even people at the top say things they shouldn't say. You know, when people they're <laughs> Yeah, you know, when I was in the army, it's like, you know, when you gave me you when you wore the uniform, you couldn't give any opinions on anything. Well, mm. I mean, when when you're a prelate, you know, you, you really shouldn't give an opinion other than the Catholic Church's position or the Catholic faith. That's really all you should say. You know, that's all you should say. It's it's a good point. I mean, the Borgias were six hundred years ago and the Roman Catholic Church survived that. So I mean yeah. it's yeah, it's it's a pretty good point. Um well, listen, that that we managed to touch on everything I took notes on, which is a credit to you for being concise and still providing so much information. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you think would be important to point out um, at all? Well, I, I think going back to your last question, I think I think what the church has to do is it has to rid itself of this Americanist mindset. Um, and, and this Americanism is the heresy as defined by Pope Leo XIII, which essentially says America knows better. You're supposed to be like a liberal society. Um, they, they need to say, look, we're Rome. We teach the world. OK. Um, and we're going to stand by that. And uh, the church need the church leadership needs to gain independence um, of the rich, the powerful private interests, convert these people and for the conversion of souls and keep its mission. And um, the rest of us need to know that doctrine and we need to stick together. We have to have unity. Uh, we have to know who we are. 
in the church and as the American people. And we have to know that what's best for the Americans is, is the Catholic faith, the natural law as set forth in the Decalogue. It is good for us. It is right for us. And we have to come together and we have to realize that we're not each other's enemy. We need to stick together. We got guys at the top that we need to focus on and convert them and bring their actions in accordance with the common good, the natural law, and uh, unity as a people. Awesome. Let um, let people know where they can check out uh, any work you're doing. And also, I'm sure you have a preferred location to purchase the book, too. And obviously, people know Amazon exists, but I'm sure you you have another address to bring people to, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a self-published work, the second edition, because I got a great um, forward by Dr. John Rao, uh, who I think I, he's a Catholic intellectual I really respect. Um, and uh, so we did a second edition, a new edition. It, it's available on uh, on Amazon. If you uh, if you want a, a signed copy, I can mail you out. A, a, I got a few copies I can send out to you that I'll be glad to sign. Uh, I post things from uh, time to time. Uh, on American Proposition website, uh, it's you know it's uh, it's controversial stuff. It's stuff you need to hear about. You know, like Vatican II was a victory, uh, mm. and you know, like there's an American people, uh, and uh, we can all get along with all the different peoples. Uh, but it's uh, looking at things from that point of view. So um, that's how you can get hold of me, and uh, I appreciate that you having me on your show. I, it's a great honor. Oh, it's 100% my pleasure, and I think this information is going to be great for everybody. For all of those people who are listening, we we here only ask that you do one thing, and that's actually four things. Like, share, subscribe, and comment on the YouTube uh, videos. Uh, make sure you go to the Substack. We'll always link that below, too. And any podcatcher that you're listening to this on, if there's a rating system, go ahead and leave the maximum number of stars or circles or whatever thing you need to do to make sure that we get up in the algorithm because that has been working really well we only started doing videos like six months ago and the show has uh, like 800 percent more viewership than it did in january so it's very helpful and i know it's because of the wonderful guests that come on i know you guys don't like hearing me talk so the more you like comment subscribe and share the more we have fantastic people like david wemhoff on to talk to you and the less you'll have to hear me do two-hour live streams yelling at the computer so um that's going to be it for me. We're going to link all of uh, uh, David's stuff down in the comments. And um, yeah, David Wemhoff, thank you so much for coming on and having the conversation with me. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, your, your questions, your comments, your observations are really spot on. And I'm really honored that you took the time to read the book and read it so quickly. Um, and I want to thank you. Well, it's definitely my pleasure. Guys, have a great weekend. We will talk to you soon. David, could you just hang on for a minute? I want to just thank you one more time off air. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll see you soon.